Are we ready? Yeah. Hey, JJ. <laughs> okay, let's get started. <laughs> hey, welcome to the next installment of Hangouts on Air for YouTube APIs. Um, I'm JJ Behrens. We have Jarek Vikevic. Um, Jarek is a mild-mannered developer relations guy by day, <laughs> hardcore Android hacker by night. And then there's uh, Jeffrey Pothek. Can you wave, Jeffrey? <clears throat> what can I say about Jeffrey? Can I say that he's an eccentric billionaire taking gymnastics lessons who keep vowing to rid the world of all evil? Probably not. I mean, that's Sergey Brin. But I will say that when I see him and Sergey Brin hanging out together, they refer to each other as Batman and Robin. And we also have Neil Norwitz with us. Neil Norwitz, man, I had to tackle like three bodyguards to get this guy out of the middle of the plex. So senior software engineer, he used to work on search, uh, and now he works on YouTube. And then we have a guest today, Adrian Hulavati, who is famous on the Jangle project. Pretty awesome. Adrian, what do you have to say for us today? Hey, I'm just hacking on a YouTube API for a little side project, so I just wanted to ask a couple of questions and see what's up. Sweet. Cool. Hey, JJ, I heard you were hiding in the Googleplex all day yesterday. What were you up to? Yeah, man, that was rough. So I had to video two 45-minute long tutorials, and it actually took eight and a half hours. Like, I've never done so many takes in my life. I mean, I thought I was going to grow up to be a software engineer, and instead I grew up to be an actor. Um, but I'm super psyched. I mean, we're going to release these at Google I.O. or slightly before Google I.O., and I think they're going to be pretty awesome. Cool. What are they going to be about? Uh, the first one is YouTube for your business, and then the second one is using Ruby on Rails and YouTube APIs for your uh, for education. Oh, cool. And so since I'm surrounded by Python guys, I mean, that's going to be more of a worry <laughs> having admitted that. <laughs> but it ought to be pretty awesome. Right. So let me ask you a few questions since I got Neil for like 10 minutes before he gets called back into active duty. Um, I want to ask you a few questions about software development at Google and YouTube uh, since you've been here for a while, and you know, I know that people love to talk about these kind of things. So, tell me about the programming languages that Google uses. So, Google has primarily four main programming languages that are used uh, very prevalently throughout Google. Uh, the, those languages are C++, Java, Python, and JavaScript. All four of them are used for fairly different purposes, although there, of course, is some overlap. Uh, many servers are implemented in C++ and Java. For YouTube, uh, it's a little bit of an exception where the primary language is Python for most of the development. Uh, Python is used throughout Google for many scripting uh, environments uh, as far as things used in production uh, when we have tools that we want to write, very often we script them. And of course, JavaScript is used primarily on the client. Great. Great. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your development environment? I, 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 I assume everyone uses Eclipse, right? Uh, there are some people that use Eclipse, and there's more people that don't use Eclipse. Uh, like all re good religious wars, Google is, is good at them as well, and for the, the editors, there's everything from VI to Emacs to Eclipse to IntelliJ, and to some extent it depends a little bit on the languages. Java certainly uses IDEs considerably more than many of the old C and C++ hackers, as well as Python and, and so forth. Sweet. Great. Uh, so I heard that Jeff, um, the famous, infamous Jeff that everyone always talks about, still codes using just a, a needle and magnetized needle and a hard drive. Is that true? I think now he's he's moved up. He starts using cat to just append to the files, and then that way he can keep adding more new code that works just perfectly flawlessly the first time. Append only editing. I mean, geez, I wish I would have taken my class to school. Um, so tell me about a day in your life. I mean, what happens when you wake up? You know, what, what's it like to live at Google? Uh, so mostly I don't live at Google. Sweet. I'm <laughs> glad to hear that. I recently bought a house about seven months ago and live in the mountains. But we spend a little bit of time at, at Google. So I'm here for about eight hours a day now, sometimes a little bit less, sometimes a little bit more, depending upon what's going on. Um, I get in now a little bit earlier in the morning than many people, which gives me a, a really good chance to catch up on email from the night before and actually get some coding done. 
before everybody gets in and the email onslaught uh, occurs. Uh, and since I switched to YouTube, I've actually been doing a little bit more coding than I was doing prior when I was working in search. Sweet. And so throughout the course of the day, obviously you have to do deal with email. You know, what are the parts? You know, you get a little bit of coding in. How's that work? You know. So I'm very interrupt driven, and so for me, I, I love being interrupted. And email I can use to service those interrupts. Uh, I, if I have any downtime, I can read email. There's always lots of threads going on. Uh, there are code reviews going on. Code reviews are very common throughout Google. They're a required part of our job. And so what I may intermix reading some email with uh, doing some code reviews, intermix with doing some coding. I do have a few meetings here and there, uh, typically less than one a day, though, at this point. And so Sometimes then I have to run to a meeting or maybe grabbing lunch with a friend, which is another meeting, or tomorrow is breakfast with a friend. Today was breakfast with somebody different. So there, there's always something going on. Uh, since Google is very distributed, sometimes we have DC meetings. My meeting this morning was through DC, similar to this. Uh, but lots of other times they're face-to-face -face or a combination of face-to-face -face and DC. Yeah, he says he goes to one meeting a day. How many meetings do you have to go to on average? Once per day, I get to sit down and do some coding. <laughs> that just goes to prove that like, what I've been saying all along is to develop a relations guys, read email, and go to meetings so that real engineers don't have to. <laughs> Sounds good to me. So, um, now, Google's really big on data, and I know that we do a lot of things with data analysis. Can you tell me how that fits in with uh, YouTube? Certainly. Uh, YouTube is a part of Google and similar in many respects, and data collection is no different. Uh, we do like to be very focused on the users, and so what we do is we don't always know what's going to work well for users and what isn't. So we run many different experiments uh, at any given time across many different pro products, yeah. most of the, the products, in fact. We are running many experiments that will be making sometimes very small changes and other times very large changes. These changes can be visible to you or in the case of the one I'm working on now is a pure infrastructure change which has very little visible component to it. Uh, we may be doing these experiments to test stability. We may be doing them to see what colors work better for users, where when users can operate faster, when they have less mistakes and so forth. And so by collecting the data based on all of the different user interactions, we can tune the UI to do a much better job and service the users better. Great. Pretty awesome. Um, now, before I came to Google, I was really, really big into code quality. And, well, I'm still into code quality, but that's one of the reasons I came to Google. I, I had heard so much about the, you know, the, th the steps that Google used to maintain high code quality. Can you tell me about those? So I already mentioned code review. Uh, that's one of the primary techniques that we use at Google to improve code quality as well as to prevent any sorts of problems down the road. It also helps communicate intent to different developers. Uh, some people do uh, pair programming, which can be very beneficial as far as communication goes. Uh, many teams do not use that, but code reviews are a way of, of getting closer to that and helping spread the knowledge as far as across the code base. Since we have a very large code base, it's very important to know many different portions of it. In addition to uh, code reviews, we also have a very strong testing culture throughout Google. It's something that early in my Google career I helped to uh, improve and make much stronger. It's uh, interesting the different perspectives that people have as far as testing and how it's evolved over time, where we've uh, attempted to drive more people to do unit testing so that we can, again, find problems sooner and prevent the problems from ever getting to users. Yeah. So one thing that I've heard from a lot of people who visit uh, Google is that even going to the bathroom at Google makes you want to be a better tester. Can you tell me about this? So this is something that uh, there is a team. There's grouplets at Google. These are groups of, of volunteers that are interested in any one task. In this case, the testing grouplet had just reformed when I joined Google nearly seven years ago. And we wanted to improve testing at Google, and we couldn't figure out, we were trying to figure out ways that we could improve testing. Google has a fairly collegiate environment, and so there was already many posters on the walls, but the bathrooms were pretty bare. We figured, where can we get a, a community of people that are, have no other choice but to read the material we wanted to present to them? And so we started putting them up in the bathroom. 
it was a little bit of a joke. And it, again, I was talking about experimentation earlier. This was one experiment, and it happened to be one experiment that was very successful. Uh, nearly 300 episodes have been run since we started it many years ago, and across a wide range of topics. And in this way, it's become part of the Google culture, and it's helped educate people, and we try to entertain people at the same time because we don't want to make it too dry and, and boring when you're already doing a pretty mundane task. That's pretty awesome. That just goes to show you that the best way to learn how to not core dump is to take a dump. <laughs> exactly. Um, so uh, can you tell me about um, how designs get done at Google in terms of, you know, how do we make sure that one rogue engineer doesn't end up doing something that's not really scalable? So. One of the things that we do, uh, especially on larger projects, is run design reviews. So Google is fairly light on many doc forms of documentation, but design docs are pretty common throughout Google. And when bigger changes are made, very often design docs are requested. Uh, on my prior team, one of my tasks was to run the whole design review process where as teams wanted to add new features, they would have to create a design doc that would explain what they wanted to do. And we would have a meeting uh, where many different people across the organization would come together and figure out, is this going to work on the production side? Is this going to work from the coding side? Uh, in the case of our team, we maintained the infrastructure, but others were adding features to the infrastructure that we were maintaining. So we had to make, ensure that the features were added in a maintainable fashion. And so design reviews were, again, a way that we could find the problems faster and before we ever got to the code review phase or certainly before we got to production. That's not to say that mistakes haven't been made. There have definitely been some products that have been released where they've pretty much fallen over. Uh, many users have experienced that, but we strive to do better each time and learn from our mistakes. Uh, so one of the other things that we do, in addition to design reviews, the other side of it, part of the culture that's very strong at Google, is having postmortems. So whenever there's a failure, failure, whenever there's a large outage, we ask for a postmortem. And this, again, spans many different products and many different projects such that we can try to learn from our mistakes. There are action items that come out. We attempt to, to address the action items so that we can prevent these same problems from occurring in the future. Right on. Uh, so I think it's pretty well known that uh, Google uses Linux. Now, do you use Linux in your development environment? I do. On a day-to-day -day basis, my desktop is Linux, and for me, it's, it's very natural since prior to coming to Google, I've used Linux for, I don't know, 10 plus years, or near, yeah, 10 plus years at that point. And so it, it was a great environment for me to come here. And most developers, virtually all developers, unless if they're specifically developing for Windows or for Mac or something like that, if they're doing a client application, like Chrome would be one example. Uh, almost all developers are, are using Linux for their day-to-day -day de uh, development. Right on. Uh, so since Google is a big user of Linux, um, I, I know that Google kind of contributes back to open source. Can you tell me, back to, tell me about that? So, sure. Uh, so prior to coming to Google, I actually was involved with several open source projects, Python being the most well-known one for sure. And uh, once I got to Google, I continued working on, Google, uh, on Python for several years, actually, and uh, was fairly well known within the Python community. These days, I I'm, I'm, have a much lower profile. But I, I still think you're famous. <laughs> but I still work on many different uh, Python tests. Since I, I've recently switched to YouTube, one of the open source projects that I've been working on is Spitfire. And so uh, since we use Spitfire within YouTube, one of my jobs has been to uh, improve the efficiency of Spitfire for YouTube. And so I've been submitting little uh, performance fixes here and there. Uh, one of the other uh, tools that I have developed in the, in the past as part of Google, I did a lot of C++ work. And so I wanted to do some lightweight analysis of C++. This was prior to Climb being a much better development environment for C++ and having a, a much richer set of tools available. And so I just wanted to do quick and dirty scripts, and so I wrote a C++ parser or approximate parser in Python and released this part of open source, which is very common throughout Google. As we have scripts that are, are not the core search part of Google, uh, we try to get as much as possible out into the open source community, uh, if nothing else, to make it available so that others can learn. Um, and if we get contributions, that's great. Uh, and certainly helping others so that they can innovate faster, so that they can develop more tools without having to develop all the basic building blocks. Right on. 
So you said that you're actually parsing C++ with Python? I thought, like, only Perl and Bjorn Strutstrup were capable of such a feat. It's, like I said, an approximate parser. It doesn't do many different constructs, but it did do a significant part of Google's code base at the time. This was several years ago now, uh, which was many, many lines of code. And uh, I ran it through the, the whole Google code base, and it did 90-plus uh, percent of Google code base. It wow. parse. And it just gave me a, an AST, an abstract syntax tree representation of the, the code so that I could do some transformations. One of the things that we used for it was to find cases where we had a base class that had virtual methods but no virtual destructor. Uh, if you don't know C++, this can be very bad because the destructor can then not be called in certain circumstances and you may leak memory or you may do other bad things like hold locks, in which case your entire program will deadlock, and that's not such a good thing. Deadlock? <laughs> I've never seen that. <laughs> no, not in Google code. So you mentioned uh, Spitfire, and I know that that's you know, not as well known as some other projects in the Python world. Can you tell me what it is? So, sure. It's a template engine. Uh, so it was based off of Cheetah, which is probably a little bit better known. Uh, but there were certain things that YouTube back in the day uh, needed out of the templating engine, and so they wrote their own and then open sourced it, uh, that being Spitfire. So Django is much more commonly used today. Uh, many more people know that uh, and is used for certain circumstances. But uh, YouTube already has a very large code base in, written in Spitfire. And so in order for us to change out of Spitfire to something else, we would need a very large uh, benefit to, that we would gain as well. And so far, we haven't been able to determine that we can make any more, we can do that much better with another template templating language, and so we use that for pretty much all of our HTML generation. So we have the, the Python code that fills dictionaries, and then those dictionaries are rendered into HTML by Spitfire. That's funny. I haven't heard people talk about Cheetah very much lately, <laughs> but I, I remember talking to the author recently at Python. Um, so a lot of people are have heard of this 20% thing at Google, and you know, a lot of people ask me, is this fact or fiction? For sure it's fact. Uh, there, it is very well encouraged throughout Google to take 20% time. Unfortunately, many people do not, and at times I've been guilty of this as well. The good thing is, is that you can bank it, and so it's not actually tracked. If you want to do 100% time for two weeks and not, not, not do any 20% time for a year on a 20% project, that's just fine. If you want to do one day a week, that would also work well. As I said, many people don't use it, which is a bit unfortunate and not really what the company wants, but it's a, a reality based on how happy so many developers here at, at Google are and that we're very much entertained by our day job and enthusiastic about our day job that sometimes it's hard to take a step back and try to work on something else. And some people just don't have any particular ideas. I had mentioned grouplets earlier. Grouplets are another way of contributing to 20% time that many people throughout Google actually use. And so in order to make the whole of Google a better place, they invest their time as a volunteer working on something that is not a formal part of Google in any way. The, the grouplets overall are, but any individual grouplet may or may not be really formalized. And uh, they just try to get done the task that they view as important. Great. Um, so you mentioned earlier your um you did some stuff at Google uh, Open Source. Uh, was that uh, a 20% project at the time? Uh, so it, it was. Uh, so the project I was working on was C++, and so I did a lot of it in my own time, and then I also did a fair amount of it on Google time as well, and that would be tw all 20% time that I worked on it. Great. So I know that um, it's a little bit strange when uh, engineers first come to Google, and in the Python world, you know, a lot of people comment that, you know, uh, Google is a black hole for Python programmers because if, if you're on the event horizon close enough to Google to get sucked in, you'll get sucked in and people might not hear from you for a little while. Why is that? So I, the various different reasons, like again, I mentioned earlier that people are very enthusiastic when they come to Google and, and that enthusiasm doesn't even wane after many years sometimes. I've been here for nearly seven years. And when I start getting bored of a project, I switch projects. I've been on three primary projects here at Google. Uh, my most previous project, I've been on for about four and a half years. Since that was a C++ project, I didn't do that much work in Python. 
However, now that I've gone to YouTube and I'm starting to do a lot more Python work again, I'm getting more back into the Python community and contributing back to Spitfire and doing some of the things that I had done many years ago. And so many people, if they've been at Google long enough, will go through various cycles where they are doing more open source and then less open source and then they can go back to doing more open source. Cool. So I guess the rumors that like engineers have to spend like 50% of their time avoiding getting hit by self-driving cars is probably not true? Probably not, although I don't know too many people that work there, so I, yeah. assume I should hold judgment. Okay. Uh, Neil, I really appreciate your coming in today. Um, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Good day. So um, now let's let's do some Q and A. And Adrian is here, another famous Python guy. What do you got for us, Adrian? Okay, turning on my mic here. Uh, so, is it? It's the right time now to ask just like really yeah. technical what questions about the yeah. Yeah, Jeffrey's already sending an email with an answer. <laughs> like, you know, for the sake of the audience, um, why don't you ask your question and then he'll say it verbally. Oh, sure. Uh, so, I have actually a couple questions. Uh, the first is, is it what's the best way to get more granularity in the uh, in the YouTube Player API in JavaScript? for the current position. So uh, I think the, the current, uh, it's only every maybe like 200 milliseconds. Jeffrey, can, a can I answer this one? Because I'm so excited I actually know the answer to this one. I am so super happy to defer to you, JJ. <laughs> Thanks. So of course we have, um, we have an iframe player that uses either uh, Flash or HTML5. And it turns out with Flash, you could only, um, uh, there are these things called keyframes that are in the stream, and so you really can't seek to anything or uh, more finer grained than a keyframe. So it's actually not so much of a YouTube thing as it is a core uh, thing about Flash. And so this comes up a lot with Flash developers. Okay, so if I were to switch to the HTML5 player, would there be a way of getting around it? Yeah, so we generally, um, you know, as a uh, YouTube API user, you generally don't pick which player you want to use because, of course, different players are used in different environments. And so, you know, there are some environments like iOS that don't even support Flash, and then there are some environments that um, don't support HTML5. And so, basically, you have to code to the HTML5 to the iframe API, and you kind of have to deal with the limitations. What, one thing you might consider, though, is, you know, test it out with HTML5 enabled. So if you go to youtube.com slash HTML5, you can uh, uh, enroll. Uh, it's a cookie that gets saved in your browser, so it's just, you know, for a single user. Uh, we don't really have a documented way to switch and force the iframe player, player to play HTML5. The idea being is that, you know, we try to make it transparent for developers and, uh, you know, eventually the functionality should really be equivalent. Uh, it, it is still not uh, but then, yeah, there's there's cases where HTML5 may actually do a little better already. So, I would be very interesting to see to see if uh, HTML5 actually improves that for you, uh, because yes. like we could give to our team uh, and see if there's anything that they could uh, they could do. And you know, maybe for certain cases, uh, we should allow you know forcing the HTML5 playback for certain types of applications. We purposely have not exposed it exposed it so that it's you know the complexity is hidden from the uh, application developer. Uh, but I did, you know, also hear uh, some evidence that uh, when it comes to the uh, resolution, uh, it's actually a little better uh, mm -hmm. with HTML5 playback. And it, sorry, Adrian, I, I just wanted to uh, see if you could clarify a little bit um, what you're doing with these timestamps. Are you seeking to a specific timestamp, or are you just trying to get the current time of the playing video and you want a higher resolution of the current time? Uh, good question. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually doing both, uh, but more the second one where I have like a timeline view of the video and I just want to have a playhead that's really nice and smooth instead of really choppy because the resolution is high. So I'm getting around it by using like set timeout, like between calls to get current time so that sort of is 
fakes it, but I'm just wondering if there was a better way. Yeah, I could answer that a little bit more. Um, uh, I recently went to HTML5 conference and um, went to a talk on animation, and one of the things that um, uh, a YouTube developer there was talking about was um, there's a new a API called uh, Git Animation Frame, and uh, this works out a little bit better than um, set timeout for various reasons, but if you have an idea of the keyframe, uh, then you could kind of fake it a little bit in order to get the smoother um, flow of the timeline. So I haven't tried that exactly, but that's probably what I would go try to do. Okay, get animation frame? Yeah, so that's, you okay. get animation frame as the backbone for your animations, and then maybe you measure how long the keyframe interval is, and then uh, thereafter, you set up a smooth animation using even CSS. You don't even need to do it in JavaScript. You could use it, uh, do it in CSS to some degree. And then, so you could have it, um, the progression animating and uh, update the animation in response to uh, changes in the playhead. Got it. So, cool. uh, just because you're not getting enough um, uh, callbacks doesn't mean that you can't be animating that time. So. Sure. Okay. Cool. I'll definitely check that out. Yeah. Uh, and then, can I ask another one? I yeah. don't mean to Please do. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a large crowd behind. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I've been posting videos to YouTube since like 2007 or something like that, and I've got around 24,000 subscribers, and I would like to be able to reach the subscribers who have been with me for a long period of time, so like before, you know, for like four years or whatever. Uh, and I don't think that there's currently a way in the data API to get it, like the, the day they subscribed. It, can you think of a way that I can get at, just like the, the early people, to sort of like give them maybe like a special thanks for being with me for a long time or something like that? Jeffrey, what do you think? Yeah, so there's actually, it's not really symmetrical, the type of information that we expose regarding subscriptions in the API. Um, so you're, you're specifically, you're, you're kind of making the assumption that there's some way to get a list of people that are subscribed to you and, you know, asking about how to find the date where said subscription took place. But the first part of that actually is impossible. Um, you can't oh. get it. You can't get a list of everybody who is subscribed to you using the data API. What you can do is get a list of every everybody that you are subscribed to. Um, so if you get a list of your own subscriptions, but not the people that are subscribed to you. So there's a there's a fundamental problem with uh, exposing the timestamps of the people who started their subscription is that that information just isn't available um, via the data API to begin with. You know, I, I have kind of a crazy idea. Um, if you've been a Gmail user this whole time, uh, Gmail actually has an API as well, and you might be able to search um, for the email that you get when someone subscribes to you um, and do it that um, way. That, that's, that's, uh, that's clever, but I turned off those emails many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that's why. I mean, what's wrong with 24,000 yeah. emails? I mean, I think <laughs> you know, so then the only other option is, uh, you know, you can engage with your users on your channel, and that's what typically people do. Uh, so, you know, uploading a video is one thing, but now there is basically a wall of sorts where you can post updates and so forth. So, you know, if you, for example, uh, want to interact with them, uh, then you could post some notices there, and they will, uh, if they subscribe to you, uh, they will get that in, in their stream. So that's typically what people do for, for engagement uh, with their audiences, is they basically use okay. the YouTube channel uh, page, and then, you know, depending on how you configure your channel, you can actually configure it in a way that uh, features the activity from you a little more prominently. And uh, so there's, you know, engagement around the single video, but there's also engagement on the channel. I think using that might be a good way, uh, you know, to achieve whatever it is that you wanted to send them uh, through email. You know, you could try to do this on the on the channel and see if that works for you because it it, it typically is what what YouTube uh, uh, stars such as yourself uh, do. Okay. So Adrian, I'm not subscribed to you, but I do remember uh, you play guitar, right? Yeah. So I've seen one of your videos, and um, your guitar playing is pretty dang amazing. I remember when I first watched oh. it, I was like, 
holy crap, he's a damn good Python programmer as well as an amazing guitarist. I mean, that's just not fair. Thanks, man. It's, uh, yeah, I wish I could do it full time, but it's hard to make a living as a musician, you know. So, um, you want to mention where the name Django came from then? Oh, yeah, it's named after Django Reinhardt, who's a uh, he was a jazz guitarist uh, in the 30s and 40s. That's uh, basically it. Pretty cool. So, uh, do you have more questions? I think uh, there is. This is very, very low level, but I guess while I have you uh, on the iPad, I've noticed that when you press play in the video uh, in the JavaScript API, it actually falsely reports that it's playing uh, for like three or four seconds, and then after like three or four seconds, then the get current position goes back to zero, and then it's correct. Does this make sense? Uh, is this a known uh, thing? Sounds like, are you using the iframe player, right? Yes. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I haven't seen that before, uh, but that would probably be a bug. Yeah, it, it unfortunately might be a bug in the way the HTML5 video element is implemented on iOS, you know, uh, WebKit. Uh, just, just in general, you know, the iframe API tends to be a fairly light layer over the native um, events exposed by the browser's HTML5 video implementation. So you do occasionally see differences in, you know, what, what might be reported in terms of the player states and you know, it's probably for the best that the iframe API tries to stay out of the way and just report what's going on in the browser um, rather than imposing its own logic and, like, having special cases hard-coded, like, you know, if this is iOS, then I should yeah. wait a few seconds before I report playback or something like that. But uh, if I had to take a guess, I would say that that's probably what the root cause is. But we, we could, you know, talk to the player engineering team and ask them to confirm that and look into it a little bit more, and maybe even file required bugs against, you know, the WebKit folks if, if needed. Okay, I'm, I'm happy to send a, like, little example thing if, if that would be useful. That would be fantastic. Okay. I know that we take iframe um, API bugs super, super seriously. We want to get those completely squashed, and that API, we want it to be completely solid. And, you know, an example will really help the team, so we'd be really mm -hmm. grateful for that. Sure. Um, Sounds good. Feel yeah. free to uh, do that via our Google group that we have set up for yes. um, YouTube data and player API questions and bug reports and things like that. Um, it is being slightly neglected right now in that all of us are super busy getting ready for Google I.O. Um, so apologies to anybody who's watching this video and has recently posted a question in the Google group that we haven't had a chance to get to yet. But these things, uh, you know, will not be ignored. It's just a slight delay in getting back to folks. So by slightly neglected, do you mean <laughs> that your average response time has fallen from, like, a mere 45 <laughs> seconds to, like, 57 seconds? It, it might be slightly more dramatic than that, but... You know, we, we, we want to make sure that everybody knows that they're being heard, even if they're not hearing back response right away. Yeah. Uh, Adrian, is that it? Yeah, that's it for me. Thanks How's so much. How was the sandwich, Adrian? I'm sorry? How was the sandwich? Oh, it was good. Sorry, I put myself on uh, uh, mute, what, visual mute, so you wouldn't see me. <laughs> you <know. laughs> so are you still in Chicago now? Yeah. Right on. How's the weather? Beautiful today, yeah. yeah. Nice. Great. Nice. Great. Um, Jeffrey, what was the best question you got asked on the Google group recently? Hmm. Best question is a little tough, but I can say that I have been helping some very patient developers recently in the Google group as they bear with uh, a few bugs that's been ongoing with uh, our player APIs in particular. So. Um, briefly talk about that. So we've had, and been having some issues related to the default playback quality that's being used for, I think in particular it's been the Chromeless ActionScript 3 player and uh, some folks have rightfully been upset because we're 
ended up defaulting to basically our 240p, which is our lowest quality um, version of, of the video, even if the player, you know, is large enough for a 720p version. So uh, this has purely just been due to some issues on our end that were introduced with some recent changes to the quality selection code, and uh, I think everything should be fully ironed out by the end of the day today when we do our weekly push of the new YouTube players and this, the associated code for that. So uh, thanks, thanks for everybody's patience regarding that. And uh, Yadek, I know you've been working pretty hard on setting up sandbox partners for Google I.O., and I don't want to get the whole list just yet, but can you give us any teasers of what we're going to see? Uh, so we'll be announcing the list shortly on uh, our Google I.O. site. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you that we'll have 12 partners uh, this wow. year, so Whoa. quite a few application developers that uh, use YouTube API for a very wide range of products. Uh, so if you're out there building an awesome app and, uh, you know, one day uh, you uh, feel like you need more exposure, uh, maybe next year you could join us at Google I.O. as well. Uh, uh, this is one of the things that we are trying to do for our application developers to help them uh, get noticed. I.O. is a huge press event uh, for us as well, so we expect good coverage. And, uh, yeah, we've been busy uh, getting it all together. Uh, the list should be coming out uh, soon, so if you're coming to I.O., uh, I hope you will visit our sandbox. We'll have some very exciting demos. Wow, it's pretty awesome. I heard something about spying on people, and I heard weird Scottish <laughs> accents with you on the phone. I, I, I just we, can't understand we, what's going we on. We will have a nice international uh, uh, representation. You know, since, since I speak with an accent, I'm trying to kind of foster that within uh, my immediate neighborhood. So we have more weird accents at the, in the <laughs> developer sandbox. But I think about 33% of participants will be from outside of the United States. Wow. I'd have to say that's pure dead brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think we're out of time today. Um, Thank you, Adrian. Yeah, I do have, I have one more question. Is it too late? No, perfect. So I, I'm working on uh, looping sections of videos with that same uh, iframe API. And I've noticed that even if the loop is very small, so like one second's worth of stuff, every time it goes back to the start, it requests the underlying video data again. And I'm wondering if there's, that seems very inefficient. Uh, so is there a way to just, like, have it cache that somehow or tell it that it's, you know, somehow clue it in that it's already seen that portion of the video and it shouldn't have to download it again? Which player? Is it Flash or HTML5 player? Uh, I would assume it's the Flash one because I'm using that MyFrame API and it picks yeah, it automatically, right? Just on the desktop. Yes. Uh, yeah. No, I don't think we cache that uh, right now. Uh, I think in theory with, with Flash, uh, there, there are some uh, possibilities, but uh, yeah, we don't, we don't do that uh, right now. I mean, this is, but this is obviously good feedback. We, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to bring this up with the players team uh, because, frankly, I think it's, it's a, little, <laughs> a little overkill uh, to do that. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just not, you know, we only now are getting into um, uh, allowing people to... Uh, script the playback with the API uh, and player parameters. Uh, so I think this is probably going to become more and more of, a, of, a, of an issue to, uh, going forward as people use the API. Yeah. I think it's a good feature request. Um, OK. OK. Thank cool. you, Adrian, so much for joining our Hangout. You made it a lot more fun having some live questions. And um, <laughs> okay. for all the people watching the live streaming, um, thanks for joining. And we'll be posting this probably on Google Developers. So. So thanks a lot, guys. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.